Great, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the audience here at ODI and those watching us through the internet for their interest in this event. We would like to do, start by doing something different. We would like to show a short video that was prepared for this report and that together with other multimedia materials can be found in the ERD dedicated website. Just four minutes uh, video. <laughs> Since the turn of the century, the Millennium Development Goals have guided global and national development efforts towards one main objective, eradicating poverty. But as the deadline for their achievement approaches, we need to review how this international collective effort can be sustained and improved in a changing global context. So the question arises, what next? Since 2009, the European Report on Development, supported by the European Commission and seven EU member states, has explored major development topics, stimulating the global debate and informing policies. In 2013, this flagship independent report, drafted by a team of researchers from three European development institutes, looks at how a new post-2015 framework could stimulate global action to promote development and support the efforts of the poorest countries. The post-2015 framework will need to adapt to a world that is changing rapidly. Forecasts of economic, demographic and environmental trends all point to the urgent need for bolder and more radical approaches to global collective action. The report highlights the need to take action on three key drivers for development. Firstly, a new framework will require not only more financial resources, but also new ones and a better use of existing ones. Secondly, trade and investment are key to support efforts to diversify economies and create jobs in productive sectors to reduce poverty and inequality. And thirdly, the international community should agree on a global migration regime. Moving beyond the MDGs means setting new objectives for a post-2015 global framework that go beyond a poverty reduction approach focused mainly on social sectors to integrate new dimensions related to inequality, employment or sustainability. But it also means moving beyond the existing instruments to explore the often untapped potential of international flows such as trade, migration and investment and support countries in mobilizing greater domestic resources. In the light of the new challenges, a post-2015 framework for development calls for a more transformative agenda. If poverty is to be eradicated, we need to tackle its roots. This calls for economic and social transformations that emphasize creating employment, addressing inequality and poverty in its various dimensions, and finding sustainable solutions. To achieve this, it will be key to ensure that global goals relate to national policy needs and targets, linking national and international efforts in a mutually supportive way. Global action will also need to be scaled up, for example in areas such as international finance, trade, migration and climate change. Enhancing policy coherence for development and continuing to increase both levels and effectiveness of aid. As part of this global effort, the EU has an important role to play. The post-2015 framework needs to build on the experience of the MDGs and keep the promise of the Millennium Declaration. Together, we can work to achieve an inclusive and sustainable future for all. I think most of you would agree when I say that this is a unique moment to reshape the global policy agenda. In the lead up to the General Assembly this year, uh, where the Secretary General will present his vision for the post-2015, a number of reports and other inputs are being produced to shape the views on what should replace the MDGs. And this report is such an input. 
the MDGs were in many ways successful, but they also have important weaknesses. And therefore, it's important to learn from that experience and build on that positive momentum. We do believe that the UN Millennium Declaration is still very relevant, and we support the implicit vision of inclusive and sustainable development. However, we think there is a need for a broader uh, thinking in terms of when designing the framework, and we introduce two concepts beyond aid and beyond MDGs throughout the report, which I will explain later. The report is mainly focused on, sorry, the first slide, yeah. The report is mainly focused on three key international drivers of development. They are development finance, trade and investment, and migration. Therefore, the report is mainly about global policy actions. Uh, we also uh, include a pers perspectives from a range of countries, in particular because we commissioned four case studies to local research institutes in Nepal, Rwanda, Cote d'Ivoire, and Peru, which really enriched the evidence base of our report. Our report is structured in three main parts. Uh, the first one is very much a reassessment of the MDG experience with chapters on the key lessons of the MDGs, what the MDGs have meant to poor countries, and here we use quite a lot of material, material from the case studies. And then we also provide an assessment of the role and contribution of the EU towards the achievement of the MDGs. So this part is a backward-looking exercise in a way that motivates the rest of the report. Part two looks at the change in global context. Many things have changed in the past 12 years or so, the global power, uh, dynamics of poverty, but also the chapter looks at the, the critical challenges on uh, relating to social, economic, and environmental dimensions by analyzing studies on trends and, and kind of providing a picture of what the world might look like in the next 30 years and trying to bring a certain sense of urgency. Uh, then part three is really the core of this chapter and builds on the other two parts and focuses, focuses on the three key policy areas that I just mentioned, development finance, trade and investment, and labor migration, which broadly correspond to three different flows, flows of money, people, and goods. We think these are three key uh, international drivers of development and they are crucial to achieve inclusive and sustainable development. Then the last chapter, brings together the recommendations put forward in the, in the report and then assesses the implications for a post-2015 agenda. Now, very briefly, I will summarize parts one and two. In terms of the lessons from the MDGs, there were key strengths. One, the MDGs were able to harness global support and efforts towards uh, improving outcomes, human development outcomes. There were also uh, an important global monitoring framework to track uh, development progress. And finally, they had some legitimacy, at least to the extent that they were based on a Millennium Declaration. But there were important weaknesses that we need to, to look at to improve for the next framework. One criticism is perhaps that they were excessively focused on the social sectors, health and education in particular, and they neglected the role of the production sectors. So here we need to put structural transformation at, at the center and the core of the new agenda. Also, the MDGs masked uh, and even rates of progress within and across countries. So inequality also needs to figure more prominently in a new uh, framework. Sustainability uh, in its three key dimensions, social, economic, and environmental, also very important, need to be reflected more strongly. And in terms of the global partnership, MDG 8 has been widely considered as a fairly weak goal. Uh, some progress, especially in terms of scaling up ODA, but it hasn't been successful in encouraging action in other areas such as trade and migration. So it's important to take stock of these experiences and, and learn uh, and move forward. In terms of the changing global context, the past 10, 20 years we have been observing a changing pattern of power with the rise of the South, growing importance of emerging countries and, and stronger uh, presence in world affairs. Also, there has been a changing regional distribution of poverty especially taking into consideration the, the fast progress made in parts of Asia. So poverty is shifting to a certain extent to sub-Saharan Africa and to more fragile countries. And then in addition to these observations, if we look at the trends, demographic, economic, and environmental, I think we really have a sense of urgency here to act. Uh, in terms of demographic trends, population is growing, albeit at a slower pace. 80% of the world population will be living in Africa and Asia by 2050 and two-thirds of world population will be living in urban areas. Now, this presents both challenges and opportunities. 
For instance, there is the prospect of a demographic dividend in Africa, but it's important that this youth bulge entering the labor market as the is able to access productive employment opportunities. Otherwise, the, the progress achieved so far in, in social and economic terms can be in jeopardy. Same thing with the urbanization. There is scope and potential there in terms of agglomeration effects, but at the same time, fast urbanization can be problematic in terms of overcrowding and pollution. These are very strong trends. In the economic uh, field, uh, there's a growing middle class in emerging economies which can provide a boost to the world economy but employment prospects remain bleak partly because of the impacts of the global economic crisis. Environmental trends are extremely worrying. Uh, global temperatures are expected to increase by three to four degrees Celsius um, by 2050, which is um, this compared to pre-industrial levels. And this is way above the two degrees Celsius um, of the climate protection target. So this can have dramatic impacts and irreversible impacts on the economy and on the environment. Resource scarcity also a big problem, especially in terms of the impact on the level and volatility of commodity prices, and can also, also contribute to social unrest. And this is precisely the theme, uh, as uh, Gaspar Fontini mentioned yet, uh, just then, the topic of the previous report, the well next is water, energy, and land. So I hope we, th in the report, we create a sense of urgency for global collective action. But before we move to uh, the recommendations of the report, I would like to introduce a framing tool that has helped us to structure thinking about the post-2015 with two interrelated concepts. The Beyond MDGs is very much about the outcomes, the sort of issues that can be included in a post-2015 framework that relates to outcomes. So, for instance, poverty, health, education, environment, employment, that illustrate how we would like the world to look like, perhaps. Beyond aid, on the other hand, is very much about the instruments or tools that can be mobilized and deployed to achieve these objectives, achieve this vision. So in a way, it's the one is the what, and the other one is the how to achieve there. And using these two um, uh, concepts, we can then have a schematic representation of the potential outcomes of the post-2015 debate. If we start on the bottom, left uh, quadrant, we have an MDG type of agenda where poverty reduction is very much the, the focus of this uh, new framework and foreign aid is the main tool of international cooperation. Now if we move upwards, we're moving beyond aid and we still have a very much narrow, narrowly defined poverty agenda but we are using a broader range of tools to tackle poverty reduction. So we are thinking about how migration and uh, trade and other sources of development finance can be geared towards reducing poverty. If we move to the right hand, on the other hand, we are broadening uh, the objective. So we are going beyond MDG. So we are including uh, aspects that were perhaps either missing or inadequately reflected in previous framework. So if we move in both directions at the same time, we have a truly global development agenda with a broader set of objectives and a broader set of instruments. So we have a more comprehensive agenda that perhaps is more complex, but perhaps one that is also more suitable for the current challenges facing the world. The ability to move in, in either direction uh, will depend on political commitment and the ability of different stakeholders to agree on specific issues. And I think it would be interesting also to think about where, where the HLP report has taken us in this diagrammatic view. Uh, in my particular personal view, I think the, the HLP report has done an excellent job in pushing us beyond MDGs with a lot of the new issues included. Uh, but perhaps on the beyond aid, perhaps it really didn't push the, the boundaries there in terms of using and addressing other tools that can be deployed. And this is preci precisely the focus of this report. So moving on to the key messages, and I'm going to start with the beyond MDGs. I think, uh, well, one key message is that the framework should promote inclusive and sustainable development, which is the implicit vision of the, of the Millennium Declaration. So the dimensions of inclusiveness and sustainability should figure prominently, especially in the targets and indicators. Secondly, the framework must build on an updated understanding of poverty, which means that uh, we might need to go beyond the $1.25 uh, a day uh, poverty measure to challenge other countries. We may also want to include national perspectives on poverty, national poverty measures, and incorporate other non-income dimensions of poverty that perhaps will not reflected in the, in the framework, such as voice and personal security. 
And also inequality needs to be addressed explicitly. So to a certain extent, there are common areas here with HLP report. But now focusing on the three key policy areas, I'm going to present trade and investment, and then James will take over. Um, this chapter is focused on the marginalized and vulnerable countries, low-income countries and LDCs, le the least developed countries. And it provides an overview of changing patterns of trade and investment. So for instance, the greater role of South-South trade and investment. And identifies key challenges and opportunities facing these countries. A key premise of the the, this chapter and the report, in fact, is the need to pursue structural transformation to change production structures into more value-added, produce and export more value-added uh, products with higher <coughs> value-added and higher productivity. So the creation of productive employment is key. And there are four elements put forward to support countries move up in the global uh, value chain and diversify their economies. The first is the need to promote modern sector exports, and this can be achieved by making trade preferences more effective. For instance, boosting aid for trade, strong investments in infrastructure, reforming rules of origin, and tackling non-trade barriers, non-tariff barriers. In terms of reducing vulnerabilities to external shocks, it's particularly important because many of the countries are commodity dependent, and some of our background papers propose, uh, put forward some interesting uh, proposals on how to reduce commodity price volatility and also to adopt facilities to mitigate the impacts of income shocks. A third key element is the need to enhance productive investments, perhaps by allowing greater policy space to countries to attract investments, higher volume, but also in better quality of investments. Investments that are perhaps targeted to high uh, labor intensive sectors and with higher productivity. And finally, it's important to improve global coordination on investment policies. The current landscape is highly fragmented with thousands of bilateral investment treaties and uh, regional agreements, so it's important to have a more coherent approach. So the basic message of this chapter is that we need a transformative agenda. Trade and investment can contribute to this agenda, and the EU has an important role to play, as we will see later on with specific um, points on the EU. This is my last slide. Uh, as I said, we commissioned four case studies, and they, although they represent different regions and different levels of development, all four countries identified the need to increase economic diversification and strengthen investment levels. For instance, Nepal and Rwanda had fairly low levels of FDI, and they were keen to attract uh, more investment in order to integrate global markets. And Cote d'Ivoire and Peru would benefit from these measures to reduce vulnerability to commodity shocks and diversify their economies. So these countries would certainly benefit from a more development-oriented international regime that caters for the need of different countries. And I'm going to pass now Thank to you. James to present the other two, two key themes. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, well, glad to be here, and thanks for, for coming. Um, for this, and I see a couple of faces of in the audience of people who helped us along the way, so that's nice for them uh, to see what we've done with the work. So I wanted to move on to the next. Um, uh, great, I've got the hang of it. Uh, the next uh, core driver of the, um, that we identified in this um, uh, study, uh, we chose labour migration because um, migration of is probably the most single most transformative experience that any individual uh, can undertake if they really want to change their economic situation. And we felt this was a particularly important issue. And I hope that uh, uh, as you follow me through this and hopefully read the chapter as well, you'll begin to understand a bit more why we feel it's so important. We focused on low-skilled migration, uh, low-skilled migrants, so uh, not uh, um, brain drain issues like that. And that's a matter of choice. Um, we could have covered a much broader agenda, but we had to focus a bit. And we felt that the low-skilled migrants are really the people probably most uh, closely um, associated with poverty in the uh, countries of origin, um, and therefore the impact of uh, them getting jobs in other places is probably the largest. And so that's the why we took that deliberate choice. <coughs> now, I think it's more and more recognized that the impact of migration, labor migration, can be huge. Uh, remittances is probably the most visible sign. Uh, nowadays, remittance levels have reached uh, about a th uh, three times as much as ODA level uh, ODA flows internationally um, going to developing countries. Of course, not all developing countries get them. Uh, there are big variations, etc. 
but they can have a huge impact. Um, and certainly one of the countries that we had a, a case study from Nepal, uh, we discovered from the, the talking to the researchers, uh, the institutes that we work with there, that over 50% of households in Nepal are affected by or benefit in some way from labor migration uh, and remittance flows. So extremely important. Um, at the same time, people who do migrate are often very vulnerable. Um, there is very little uh, mechanisms to, to help them. Uh, it's a very uncontrolled sector. It is not a sector where um, governments have come to any agreements internationally. Rights are not protected, etc. Yet, certain developing countries are beginning to, uh, well, some of them have been doing it for some time, uh, promote labor migration as a way of encouraging uh, labor flow, uh, of encouraging um, uh, inflows of finance. Um, and some developed countries, receiving countries, um, are also r recognizing the importance of this and uh, um, uh, do make a quite extensive use of labor migration. There is, of course, also migration between south-south, so not just north, so uh, south to north, but uh, uh, between developing countries. It's about the same level internationally um, and can be extremely important to in promoting uh, development. And what we're basically arguing by, uh, through the, the, the bringing all this literature together and seeing where the debate is, is that essentially there a lot more could be done in terms of international regimes uh, to promote uh, labor migration and to increase the flow of remittances, um, protect the rights of migrants, uh, and hopefully also um, boost development, not just uh, in developing countries, but also um, boost growth in uh, developed countries uh, where um, migration can be a big benefit. Um, we've taken, we've got uh, uh, the, the case study countries actually all had something to say about migration. I've already cited Nepal. Um, in fact, the World Bank reckons that 20% of the decline in poverty during the, uh, the years of the, uh, the MDGs can be attributed to um, remittances from migra migrant uh, labor. So if um, uh, Nepal is doing quite well against the uh, um, MDGs, it is to a very large extent due to migrants. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire, the story is rather different. In the past, when the, um, the uh, Côte d'Ivoire uh, in the 60s and 70s had a bit of a boom economy. It depended also on uh, migrant labor coming into the country from other parts of the region. Um, in the latter years, and more recently, that has become more of a political issue. Um, uh, um, there's increased pressure on land by, uh, from the descendants of those early migrants um, has meant that there are tensions which have been exploited for political purposes. In Peru, we're actually getting migrants coming back to Peru um, Peruvian migrants who've migrated to Europe and being followed by young Europeans um, looking for jobs uh, coming from our own continent where jobs are fewer to find. So you can see the sort of impact of uh, uh, migration and our uh, senses that uh, promoting migration could be a really important way of encouraging growth and development. Moving to the third and last uh, of our um, uh, drivers, uh, development finance. There, basically, we review quite a number of uh, sources of finance in the chapter, not just ODA. We do sp dwell a bit on ODA, but we also look at other forms of uh, uh, development finance, uh, investment, um, South-South cooperation, um, domestic resource mobilization. We felt there's um, a long section on that. We felt it's particularly important. Um, and we come to the conclusion, basically, that what is required in an era where uh, ODA levels are now starting to stagnate um, that we should be looking much broader, much more broadly at lots of different types of uh, development finance and trying to uh, both diversify and be more selective in the way they're indivi used individually. Um, and a lot of the analysis in the chapter is about that. Domestic resource mobilization has a particular value in that it is obviously very important uh, in to country governments in that it gives them a policy space. If anything, it's the, the source of money that gives them the most policy space. And yet, a lot of the, the ability to collect uh, uh, taxation uh, and collect uh, resources, um, uh, mobilize resources from taxation in country can be uh, influenced by the policies of international, uh, international level policies or policies in, uh, uh, from developing countries, so around illicit flow, uh, transfers, uh, et cetera. So we could be doing a lot more internationally uh, to support uh, developing countries in that. 
Um, case study, case study, country experiences. Um, ODA was particularly important in Nua, Nepal and Rwanda, we found. Um, but uh, as I've already indicated, in Nepal, it wasn't just ODA that was important to financing development. Uh, the remittances were important. And the instability, uh, political instability in Nepal also meant that uh, uh, donors were quite often quite reluctant to put money into budget support, uh, which giving less, uh, less uh, flexibility to the Nepali government. Uh, we were getting picking up messages of uh, um, ODA ha um, donors had their priorities, which were not always the same as the priorities of the government. In Rwanda, there was a much stronger um, uh, coherence between what the donors were interested in and what the government was interested in, and that followed through with um, very high levels of uh, budget support um, <coughs> and the, the government quite a, a sort of developmentalist approach that you'll no doubt be fam familiar with. Cote d'Ivoire was a very interesting case because despite the, the, the last... Uh, uh, five, ten years of uh, instability there, there had been some very good fiscal di di discipline and domestic resource mobilization was still <coughs> extremely high. In Peru, ODA was a minor importance, but still Peruvians were saying to us, we are keen on cooperation with uh, European countries because of uh, uh, the, the greater, uh, because of sharing of knowledge and, and ideas and uh, ways of doing things. So the international cooperation remained important, uh, but it wasn't the ODA. And in all four countries, we found that South-South cooperation gave variety and additional opportunities. Um, this is back to the list of the uh, 10 main messages which you'll find at the back of the executive summary. Uh, we've picked out another couple here. Um, I won't go through them in detail. You can read them for yourself. But I think number nine is quite important in that it basically what we're trying to say there is that there are quite a number of challenges facing the globe at in this post-2015 era, and a number of these challenges need to be met together. So I'm thinking poverty, certainly, but also climate change, uh, setting up trade regimes. And in a sense, what we're looking for is perhaps a, a set of different agreements and so on, which are mutually uh, reinforcing and um, uh, supportive. And finally, in the last uh, few minutes, if you'll allow me, I'd like to turn to the European Union and what it can be doing. I think our key message there, number 10, is that while it's important for the European Union uh, member states uh, and Commission to continue uh, the work with ODA, with assistance levels, actually it is probably more important to be spending, uh, pushing uh, policy coherence for development and uh, global collective action. That the weight the EU can, um, um, can put behind those sort of actions is extremely important globally. So here we've uh, identified um, a few implications for the EU in a bit more detail. So the point about ODA stagnating, that it's still important to uh, push for the 0.7% uh, target. Effectiveness remains important. It's still important to increase impact, et cetera. The Commission's uh, paper on agenda for change, the, the, um, the policy paper from 2011, which was approved by the Council, um, how to increase the impact of ODA uh, becomes very important. And then here you see the, the title on policy coherence for development, which the Commission, the, the Union has put a lot of effort into since the Maastricht Treaty when it was first stipulated, um, but has now become part of the Lisbon Treaty, um, and there's various steps that have been taken to try and promote it. It's not easy to make progress on this, very difficult in fact, but it remains extremely important. And then the point about international uh, negotiations. Towards the end of the report, you'll find this table, Table 10.1, if my memory serves me right, which tries to sort of show the, the influence um, that the, com the Union can have in the three areas that we identified, trade and investment, development finance, and labor migration, but also in the level, uh, level of global governance. Um, and we've tried to identify here some examples of positive influence uh, and yet also areas where there could be room for improvement. Um, I'll let you go through that at your leisure. You'll find it to the back of the report. And then our final key conclusions are transformative agenda is vital, and this is where, as you were saying, Kevin, it comes back to the, the point of the HLP. Um, we also emphasize very strongly the importance of national ownership. Um, it is important to have an international framework. There's clear evidence that that helps. But you do have to have a framework that is flexible so that uh, governments can uh, take their own road and uh, develop that. Um, MDG8, scaling up global collective action, vital. Um, and then we should be, as we um, uh, go on, proceed with the post-2015 debate, 
uh, we should be looking uh, as much at the instruments as much as at, as at the objective. So how do we do it as well as what we want to do? Sorry, that's taken a bit longer than I'd hoped. But, uh, James, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I didn't interrupt you, actually, because I thought it was a tremendously helpful way of, of setting it out. And I, I mean, it seems to me that one of the great strengths of this report is the way that you've taken four countries, e you know, each of which tells us a very different story about some of the challenges fa facing Europe. Um, so, Paul, uh, over to you. You're, you're probably still in the shell shock post H high level panel report state, but it, I think you're very well placed to maybe reflect a little bit on some of the similarities and maybe differences as well. Sure. 